We as a pastoral team uh, have been really praying together and we've been asking this question. What at this season, at this moment in our church's story, do we need to make sure we, we not miss? Have you ever had a question like that? I thought like that is like, hey, what, what's really important that I not miss right now? Maybe when you first uh, were getting married and you think, okay, what are the things that's really important? As we start this new life together, or maybe when you brought your children home from the hospital, you're like, okay, what is it really important that I don't, and maybe you're calling your mom or dad, hey, like, how do I, where's the manual for this little thing I just brought home from the hospital? Like, there's no manual. Like, what is it that I really need to make sure I not miss? And, and we were thinking about that as a church is we really take this, like, we kind of cross the Jordan River. If you, if, you, if you know your Bible story, you know what that means. The children of Israel were wandering through the desert and God had brought them right to the edge of the, of the, of the Jordan River. They're gonna cross that river into the promised land. You know, these are just pivotal moments. And one of the things that we were thinking about that I, I know I've been really press, uh, wrestling in prayer with is if there's one thing we can't miss right now as we're laying really new foundation for this new chapter it really is prayer. It's prayer. Everything happens, we know, out of a season, of a, of a community, of a time of prayer. God does things when people pray. Is that true? Okay, let me say that one. God does things when people pray. Okay, there you go, there you go. Yeah, yeah, like it really is true. This is, this is it. And like I was saying a minute ago, as we give you that update, that these are exciting moments because we're gonna start seeing God do some things. We're gonna start experience provision. And we're like, can you believe that story? Can you believe that person stepped up in that way? Can you believe that that person was able to d- donate that opportunity or, or that, you know, that skill set or whatever it is? And we're gonna experience these things. But friends, they're only gonna happen in response to our church, our community really praying. And that happens at a, at a community level, but it happens at an individual level. God wants us to pray. But as I started thinking about this series, okay, what are some of the challenges with prayer? What are some things that people struggle with in prayer? What are things I struggle with in prayer? Uh, I want to I want to kind of maybe name a couple of these and see if this is you or me. It's, it's definitely me. Do you ever struggle with your mind just wandering off when you pray? You start to pray and pretty soon you're thinking like all kinds of stuff you have to do for the day or maybe even dark things. It's like spiritual warfare happening. You don't realize it. Or maybe you just have these nagging questions that might keep you from really staying in prayer. Like, is this even doing anything anyway? Is there any, is this doing any good? I mean, would things have turned out the same had I not prayed? Uh, you know, and what does it mean, this whole like house of prayer thing we're talking about? Maybe you heard that this morning, like, what does that even mean to have a house of prayer? Um, you know, I've struggled with some of those things. And, and maybe you feel like there's something we're missing or you're missing when it comes to prayer. Maybe we need to reframe it though. Let me, let me ask a different question. Maybe instead of, you know, does prayer work or, or, or how does it work? Maybe I need to ask this question is what should I actually be expecting when I pray? Or maybe I I'd ask the question, what is the role that prayer should play in my life? You know, we have such a, our culture, right? We have this kind of this um, very pragmatic approach to life. I do this and I receive that. You know, I go to work and I get this paycheck. I go to the doctor office, I get this prescription. You know, I go to prayer, I get this prayer request answered, right? We have this very pragmatic approach to how we face and how we, you know, approach life. But what if I, I looked at prayer different? Maybe that's not exactly how it's supposed to work in my life. Maybe there's something else to prayer than that. I want to um, <clears throat> call your attention to the title of our series, House of Prayer. And this phrase, House of Prayer, it comes out of a really surprising moment in Jesus's life. We're going to talk about this moment in Jesus's life that you, a lot of you are familiar with, but if, if you're honest, this doesn't sound a lot like Jesus. This is kind of like a surprising Jesus this morning. Because he uses this phrase, he actually is quoting Isaiah in, this, in, in today's sermon, in the middle of a, of a time where you might say Jesus really was upset. He was angry. This is not normal. We, we don't normally associate Jesus as being angry or upset. But something had deeply bothered Jesus. So last week, we talked about this, this sermon that Jesus gave on the Mount of Olives. And we said the Mount of Olives is right outside of Jerusalem. 
And we looked at last week the, the two mountains in, in Matthew, the mount, of, uh, the mount that he taught, the Sermon on the Mount, and then the Mount of Olives where he kind of finished his ministry and he teaches those three parables. That's near the end of his life. Right before he preaches on the Mount of Olives, Jesus does something very, very cataclysmic in a sense. He enters Jerusalem on a donkey. If you guys remember the story, he enters triumphantly into Jerusalem. The people are shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. They're laying palm branches out. They're saying the King has come. The Messiah is here. Like the crescendo of all of Jesus's expectation and ministry is now arriving. And the disciples are thinking the kingdom is here, man. Rome better watch out. Jesus is entering. And instead, he goes and he visits the temple. Mark tells us the sun is starting to go down. He looks at the temple, then he goes home. But he saw something that afternoon as the sun was setting that I think bothered him. You ever see something that just bothered you? You know, something that was going on that shouldn't be going on the way it is. It just kind of stirred you up. Little, little like righteous indignation, little like, ah, why is that happening? Why is that being allowed? Well, what is it that bothered Jesus? Let's look at this. Mark chapter 11, look at it. When they arrived back in Jerusalem, this is the next day. So he just entered Jerusalem the day before on that donkey. He entered the temple and he began to drive out the people buying and selling animals for sacrifices. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. And he stopped everyone from using the temple as a marketplace. And as he's doing this, he says, the scriptures declare my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations. But you have turned it into a den of thieves. Angry Jesus. Anybody like angry Jesus, right? We like gentle Jesus. We like, you know, the Jesus that tells us to love our enemies, right? But how are we like an angry Jesus this morning? The table flipping, money driving... Jesus with the whips. Well, why is he so upset? You know, I don't know what you and I think of prayer. Maybe, maybe today you're not sure. How does it work? Does it work? You know, all these questions. You might have some ambivalence about prayer yourself. And I might at times struggle in my prayer life, but here's something we cannot doubt based on our story today. Jesus took prayer seriously. Now, we might not take it as serious as we should, but Jesus took it seriously. In fact, I'll tell you this, he took it so seriously, friends, at this juncture, at this part in the story, he is really poking the bear. He's in the temple. He's driving out the money changers. The very next verse, look what the very next verse says. As a result of what he did, the leading priests and teachers of the religious law heard what Jesus had done. And look at this. They began plotting or planning on how to kill him. Guys, Jesus took prayer so seriously that when he saw something hindering prayer in his community, in the community, in the, in the city of Jerusalem, that he was willing to die so that prayer could continue. It is the domino that he flicked that starts a, a series of events that leads to his, his arrest, trial, and execution. Jesus is that serious about it. He's willing to die for it. He's willing to say, I'm, I'm gonna take on whatever power structures are in place that have hindered prayer in this temple. I'm gonna drive out these money changes. I'm gonna drive out this entire nonsense that's, that's, that's happening here. So why? Why is he so upset? Why is he willing to die for this? Why is he willing to put it all on the line and say, you will not make my father's house a den of thieves. You will not make what was supposed to be a house of prayer into this nonsense. Well, I want, to, I want to remind you what he's saying while he's flipping over the tables. He says this, the scriptures declare my temple will be called a house of prayer. And notice this, for all the nations. So what was, where was these, where were these money changers? Where, where was all this? Well, you have to understand the temple complex had this interior part where the priest would enter, and then this really sacred space in the middle of it called the Holy of Holies. But just outside of the interior part of the temple was a court, a large court called the Court of the Gentiles. And the court of the Gentiles was reserved for people who were not kosher, who were not following the laws of Moses, the Torah, to, that, were, that were feeling drawn to the God of Israel. 
that the, the, the fame of Yahweh had spread to the edges of the earth and people would stream into Jerusalem. This is the prophetic vision of what God wanted, that out of this spot, the, the world would know there's only one true God and that he resides in this place. We're gonna look at that in a second. And so this court of the Gentiles was built and designed so that Gentiles could get near. They could hear the singing. They could smell the incense being offered, the morning and evening sacrifices that were being offered inside the temple by the priests. They could see that. They could witness that from afar. And they could draw in and experience the worship of Yahweh. But instead of that court of the Gentiles, there's a farmer's market. <laughs> Picture that. You know, there's wheeling and dealing. There's these canvas tents set up all over, all over the place. There's money changers, and the money changers would, would take the Roman currency, and they would exchange it into the temple currency. And they would do that at, a, at an exorbitant rate that was kind of ripping people off. And then there was the, the people selling the sacrificial animals. If, if you wanted to bring an animal into the temple, it had to be thoroughly checked out. And there were some shady practices happening there. And so all around, Jesus walks into this court of the Gentiles, which was designed by Yahweh to be a place where the people who are far from God could get near to God. And instead of the, the, the access to the temple, there's this crazy Middle Eastern bazaar with all these sellers. And it just boils him. Guys, I want you to see the zeal of Jesus. I'm here to make access to God possible. This is exactly what I've come to do. I've come to make a way back to God. I've come to break down anything that's holding people away, that's pushing people away. This is supposed to be a house of prayer and it's become a den of thieves. And Jesus wasn't gonna stand for it. Guys, I think that's a, that's a powerful moment in the, in the life of Jesus. And I wanna ask you, as we, as we think about this for a second, man, what's cluttering you in your walk with Jesus? What's, what's getting in the way of your access to the Father? What are the, what are the money changers and the animals you know, being sold in, in the temple courtroom for your life? What's, what's, what's blocking your view of the temple? What, 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 where in your house does Jesus need to flip over a few tables and clean out some money changers? You know, this is the thing. It's, it's just human nature, right? Our lives get cluttered. This is supposed to be, I, I'm supposed to be a temple of God. If you follow Jesus, if you've received Jesus as your king, God says his spirit dwells in your temple, in your life. But man, our temples can get cluttered, can't they? I don't hear anyone saying amen right there, right? But man, there could be some money changers running around in my temple. There could be all kinds of things cluttering the view. And that's where it's like, okay, Lord, would you just take that same zeal that you had on that on that. Tuesday morning, or actually it would have been Sunday morning, wouldn't it? If you did the math right, huh? Because triumphal entry would have been, I'm trying to do some math real quick. What day of the week was that? Yeah, I should look at that up. Whatever day of the week that was, he's walking in there, right? And he's like, no, this isn't happening. Man. So the first question is, what's cluttering, what's cluttering my temple? When Jesus is quoting this, he's actually quoting Isaiah 50, 56. And Pastor Jeremy read this during worship. And this is that vision that God has for the whole human race one day, that we, as we're praying for God's kingdom to come and his, and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, we're praying for this. This is what we're longing for as followers, that one day, here it is, I will bring them to my holy mountain of Jerusalem and I will fill them with joy in my house of prayer. Guys, we're supposed to, by faith, Picture this day one day when the streams of the populations of the earth are streaming in to Jerusalem and they're worshiping Jesus enthroned as new Jerusalem has landed there, like the whole world. And they're filled with joy at the house of prayer. And he accepts their burnt offerings and their sacrifices because my temple will be called a house of prayer, a prayer for all the nations. And that was a, that was a prophetic dream that Isaiah had because the original temple that Solomon built never really fully lived up to that. I mean, this temple that Solomon built was supposed to be this place that would really draw the world to Israel and in, and in doing so lift up worship to Yahweh, but it never fully lived there. Israel never fully walked in their calling to be a light to the nations. And Jesus 
Jesus did what Israel couldn't, right? Jesus says, I'm gonna fulfill the, the, the covenant promises that God made to Israel, but I'm gonna fulfill their obligations. I'm gonna do what they couldn't do. I'm gonna be that light to the nations. In fact, my people, the ones who follow me, are gonna be that light. But I wanna show you what, what Solomon, when he dedicates the first temple, what he prays. This is what he hoped for. This was his aspiration. Look what he says. He says, may your eyes, he's praying to God, may your eyes be open toward this temple night and day. This place of which you said, my name shall be there so that you will hear the prayer of your ser- that your servant prays toward this place. Hear the supplication of your servant and your people Israel when they pray toward this place, hear from heaven, your dwelling place. And when you, and, and, and when you hear, forgive. So there's this prayer of when, when Solomon was dedicating this temple, he's praying, God, from this day forward, when anyone prays toward this place, and if you, if you read the rest of this chapter, he would even include the Gentiles. Even when Gentiles pray, when they hear about God, they come here, man, may this be a place of prayer. May this be a place where you hear and forgive the, the sins of the people. A house of prayer, a house of prayer. So I wanna, I wanna ask this question. <clears throat> when we think of a place that's sacred, that's set apart for prayer, a physical location where when Solomon's dedicating this temple that people could count on, like that's a place where people can gather to pray. What, where, where is that for us today? Where is that up for us now? now? You know, when Jesus came and he breathed his spirit into the church, now, as I said a minute ago, each of us become mobile temples. We all become like little temples where people can gather and pray. And in fact, guys, that's exactly what the early church did. The early church gathered and prayed. They made their little gathering places, little temples, where the church could gather and they could start to, they could start to really, really experience everything that kind of was going to happen in that Solomon's temple that eventually gets destroyed, right? Today, there's no temple there, right? Today, we talked about that last, last week, I think, that there's a, a Muslim mosque there where the temple once stood, but that's not what God had for the people anyway. Once the spirit was poured into the church, now everywhere we gather becomes these little houses of prayer. These places where people can say, man, when I'm with you, I just feel the spirit. C- can I ask you a question though? When's the last time you really prayed with somebody? When's the last time you really experienced a house of prayer with somebody? See, see, I think, I think we just live in a very individualist culture, don't we? we? We don't really share our burdens with anybody. We don't really invite people in. We don't really say, hey man, I, I really need prayer. I mean, maybe a few of us do that, but I'm talking about as a, as a, as a rule, we're pretty private. We even say that there's two things you don't bring up in public, right? Religion and politics, you know? Let's just keep that private. Whatever you believe on your own, you just keep it to yourself. And maybe you might have a a spouse you pray with, or maybe you don't. And, you know, those pre-meal prayers, they don't really count. Can I just say that? (laughs) That's not real prayer. I don't know what that is. You know, that's like some nursery rhyme that we tell God, you know. Some of them sound the same every single time, you know, I don't know. Um, like rub it up dub thanks for the grub. I, I don't know, right? No, that's not prayer. I'm talking about real prayer. I'm talking about, man, I need something from God today. Would you, would you just partner with me? W- would you just get down on your knees and would you just pray with me? Guys, this was normative for the early church. This is what the early church did. Let me quickly, look, look, look at Acts. Look at this, Acts 1. They all joined together constantly, let's all say it, in prayer. Along with the women, and by the way, Mary, the mother of Jesus. How would you like her at your prayer meeting? That would be legit. Like, hey, Mary, can you just pray with me? Like, please, right? Like, you're the one that taught Jesus a lot of his prayers. Put, that would just be cool. Anyway, and his brothers are there. Like, how awesome. This is the early church. They're waiting for the des- descent of the Holy Spirit, and they are praying with each other. Next chapter, chapter two. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread. And let's all say it, and to what? Prayer. 
A couple of verses, chapters later, verse chapter four, when they heard this, they raised their voices together in what? I like that, raised their voices together in prayer. That, that to me is a little intensity. When's the last time you raised your voice with somebody in prayer, right? Again, we have these very pious, quiet, private, come on, guys, let's rip some tables, let's knock some, come on, right? You guys, anybody with me on this? Like, let's pray. Oh, I'm really struggling with some major problems in my marriage, and I just don't know. Okay, okay, is that, right? is that really where you're at? How about this? Hey, you know what? If God doesn't come through, I'm toast. Would you pray with me? Lord, come through right now. Like, Amen. what if we prayed like that? Like, what if literally, like, if your battle is big, maybe your prayer needs to be big. Maybe you get a whole bunch of people and say, let's fight fire with real fire, right? Because I don't have the power, but I know someone who does. So I'm going to raise my voice in prayer with my brothers and sisters, and we're going to make this a house of prayer. Thank you. Thank you very much. One day, this church, when they hear we're going to shout because we're in training mode, but man, I know we're going to get there because that's right, because we're going to experience miracles together. Anybody agree with me on that? Do you think this church is going to experience the miracles of God together? Yes, but it happens when we actually are a house of prayer, right? I could go on and on. I'll give you one more in Colossians, just so you see, this is the normative thing. Paul says to this church in Colossae, devote yourselves to prayer. He's talking to that whole group. Devote yourselves to prayer. So it's, to me, it's obvious. You look at the New Testament, these house churches were houses of prayer. These little mobile temples, they got together and they prayed. And guys, I believe when they prayed, I think the walls shook, sometimes literally. I think these little house churches set the Roman Empire on fire because in, it, it became kind of the rumor around town that there was this group of weird Jesus followers that met sometimes before sunrise and they would pray together and all of a sudden like miracles are happening, healings are happening, prophecies are happening and the churches around, I'm sorry, the community around is like, who are these people? And what is this God? Who is this Jesus? And literally guys, they're having communion in the mornings early and the word is they're cannibals. Isn't that wild? That there's actual written testimony from the ancient world because they knew these Christians got up early and ate and drank the body and blood of Jesus and no one understood what that meant. And they literally mistook that for ca weird cannibalism. The point I'm making is the, pro the practice of the early church, even misunderstood by the larger pagan culture, was making a difference. And by the third and fourth century, the entire Roman Empire falls at the feet of Jesus. Come on. That's powerful, powerful, powerful spreading of the gospel of Jesus. These house churches made a difference. They were houses of prayer. But I want to point out something. I want to go back to Jesus. So he's kicking tables. He's moving these money changers. He clears out the temple. Now you can see the temple again. And what does he do next? Look at this, Matthew 21. This is the very next thing he does. And the blind and the lame, they come to him in the temple and he heals them. The blind and the lame were not allowed in the temple. They were excluded and Jesus says, I'm making access. Come on, come right here. And I'm gonna heal you in this place because there's a connection, friends, between healing and prayer. There's a deep connection. When people pray, people get healed. There's this healing prayer connection that happens. There's this healing connection that happens when we say, God, I'm bringing my brokenness to you. I'm bringing my need to you. I want to ask this question. Why, why, why do humans pray? Where did it come from? Why is it a part of every human's existence? We, atheists even pray. Why is it part of the human experience to pray? Here's why. Because we live in a world that's broken. Because we experience all kinds of need and lack in our world. And we don't know what to do with those things. And we're designed, I think we're hardwired to take that and to say, okay, God, I need help here. 
And so God says, listen, here's, here's the method. Here's the, here's the point. Here's what I'm giving you. I'm giving you this ability, this access. If you know Jesus through the son of God, I'm giving you this powerful access into my throne room to where you can bring those, those painful things to me and I can meet you in those needs. Guys, I believe that prayer is God's pain reliever for a world that's afflicted. I believe that it's, it's meant to play this pain relieving effect. It doesn't mean God just magically just is ordered around by people's prayer. What it does mean, and this is really interesting, that God says, okay, as you pray, I'm gonna supernaturally, in ways that you might not realize in the moment, but I'm gonna start sustaining you in your trial. I'm gonna start giving you peace when it doesn't make sense. I'm gonna start giving you strength when you feel like it's, you're weak. I'm gonna sustain you as you invite me into your pain. I'm gonna sustain you. And I might not completely just magically take you out of that out of that situation, but almost, if you could kind of use this and forgive me if you think this is sacrilegious, but almost like an aspirin, almost like an ibuprofen to kind of relieve that pain enough for you to say, okay, I can keep going. I've got this and I'm gonna be sustained in this. This is a, it's the pain reliever of heaven. And sometimes God does a miracle in direct response to your prayers, but more often it's, I'm gonna strengthen you in your trial to help you through your trial. I'm, you're inviting me in. And that's why people could say, I'm experiencing the peace that passes understanding. I'm experiencing the joy in a circumstance that shouldn't be joyful. The circumstance didn't change, but all of a sudden the inner man changed. I, I've been memorizing this passage in the book of Ephesians. And in this passage, it talks about how Paul bows his knee before the father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derive its name. And then he says, and I pray that you right, would be able to experience from his glorious riches power through his spirit in your inner being. I want you to think about that. Paul's saying, I'm asking God to strengthen you in your inner being through this prayer. I, I want to end today with an example of this in scripture. I think this is part of the normative practice of the church. When people were in pain, they went together in prayer. Look at this in James chapter five. Look what it says. He says, are any of you suffering? What's the answer? Yes. Is anyone suffering hardships here, here today? Yes, right? Do you think people were suffering hardships in James's day? Yes. Look what, his, look what Pastor James says. You should pray, <laughs> okay? Hey, are you suffering hardships? Yes, I am then you should pray, right? Are any of you happy? Well, yeah, I'm happy. Well, then you should sing praises. So if you're up or if you're down, if you're going through a great time or if you're going through a struggle, bring God into your life, James is saying. But he's gonna go back to this suffering uh, issue. Are any of you sick? If, if any of you are sick, you should call for the elders of the church to come and to pray over you. How many of us have done that? Again, I, I want to I throw, we're having playoff baseball right now, right? I want to throw a strike right now. I don't want to throw you any curveball, ask you straight up. The last time you were in a bad way, did you call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you? I would say most of us suffer in silence. Am I wrong? Most of us keep it all to ourselves. What's Pastor James saying we should do? Yeah, hey, Pastor Brad, Pastor Jeremy, Jamie, I need the elders to come over. I need you to pray over me. I need you to pray over my mom, I, I, my life group leader. I need a bunch of the men and women that are elders in our life group that kind of play that role. I need them to come over and pray over us. See, that's what I'm trying to say, guys. I don't think we're actually living out the, these teachings. He even says, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, I'm not gonna pretend to know exactly what this phrase, anointing with oil, means. There's good um, explanations on two sides of this. Was this a, an actual practice 
um, that would like somehow bring the Holy Spirit more powerfully into a situation? Or was this a medic medicinal thing and they're literally praying for the oil to do some medicinal work in an injury or an, an affliction? I don't know. But here's, but either, either way, the power isn't in the oil, right? The power is in the, in, in the person that we're praying to with the oil. And so the question is, is are we anointing people with oil? Are we bringing God's attention to this situation? Are we saying, Lord, my marriage is in trouble. I am afflicted. I need people to pray for me and my husband, me and my wife. My child is, is so far away from Christ right now. They're, they're prodigal right now. Lord, I need people to pray and lift up their voice in prayer. Guys, what happens when we pray together? Guys, when we pray together, we... We are healed together. That, that, that's, that's the point today. There's this connection between prayer and healing, and, and it's meant to be done together. It's meant to be done as a group, not just an individual. Yes, we individually pray, and yes, Jesus individually prayed, but there's this corporate side that I think we're missing. And so I, I'm really just trying to ask us this, this morning, can, can we pray together? I guess really the question that I want, I want, I want you to ask, answer, can, can we really pray together as a church, either corporately in this large setting or in your life groups? And that's really where it's going to happen most. It's really going to happen in your life groups. That's why you hear us say almost every Sunday, every one of us need to be in a group, a small group of people that know us, where we're known and we're grown, where there's a leader, Pastor Jeremy's been doing an outstanding job training our leaders to, sh to, to be these shepherds that will, that, will, that will practice this. Let's look what James says. Look at the end of what James says. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed any sins, Sometimes it's a sin issue. You'll be forgiven. Look how he ends. Confess those sins to one another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Man, if Americans are anything, we are result-oriented, aren't we? Then we ought to be all in this because this produces wonderful results. Guys, does anyone have a need in their life for prayer? Is there anything right now that if you were honest is heavy on your heart and if you were courageous enough to share it with a friend, a life group partner, a brother, a sister, you could use that prayer? We do a little experiment. If you could use some kind of prayer, would you raise your hand up? I am not surprised. We are a needy people. So can we pray together? What would happen? What would happen to Henderson if we prayed like crazy? What would happen in your family? What would happen downstream of your generation to your kids and their kids? And their, I am praying right now for my great grandkids. Isn't that weird? I don't know why God just started asking me to pray for my great grand. I want a legacy behind me. Anybody else want a legacy behind them? Man. I want us to be a place of prayer. I want us to be a place that Henderson, the secret gets out. And they're like, man, you need something? That church will pray. And they believe. And the miracles that they are experiencing are incredible. And it would be a work of God. It would be a demonstration of the Spirit. It wouldn't be attributed to any fancy preaching or great worship music. It would literally be a move of the Spirit that would bring our city to know Jesus. Who's hungry for that? That's me. Can, yeah, can you guys stand with me right now? I want us to just have a moment where we let the Spirit do some work in our heart. And I want you to, you're mentally, if you could kind of close your eyes, I want you mentally to picture that crazy, confusing farmer's market, okay, that was in front of the temple, obscuring the view of the temple. And I want you to let that picture almost be like your heart. 
And I want you to ask Jesus this question. Jesus, what's blocking the view? God, what needs, what needs to be, what do you want to just kick out <laughs> so that there's no more, you know, blockage so people could see the temple, so I can pray? Right now, with your head bowed, your eyes closed, would you just do that? Guys, maybe right now, the thing that's blocking you is your own, your own um, lack of relationship. You just don't have anyone that you're close with like that. If you're being honest, you just don't have that. And that's really blocking it. And, with the, and the table that Jesus needs to flip is, is, your, is your aversion to really being in community. And so right now, I'm gonna pray against that. I'm gonna pray that God so stirs you up that even though it's risky, even though it's scary to go and be a part of a life group, that, that, that you would say, no, I need this. I've been doing this alone for too long. Maybe that's the table that God needs to flip. Maybe it's some sin in your life and you know it and you're asking God to bless you, but you haven't really been surrendered to him. And so that table needs to go. I don't know what it is. James mentions that. I don't know what it is for you, but I'm just praying the Holy Spirit of God would kick out some tables so that nothing would hinder that access. Lord, would you do that work in this church? God, would this church be known as a house of prayer? May our life groups be known as a, a, as a place of prayer. May we share each other's burdens, God. Father, I pray for those that are here this morning who don't yet know Jesus, that right now they would have a soft heart to the message of the gospel. Soften their hearts, oh Jesus. It, with your head bowed and your eyes closed, if you're here this morning and you've never given your life to Jesus, I wanna give you an opportunity right where you stand to give your heart to Jesus. If you know that's you, right now, I'm gonna invite you right where you stand to say this prayer of, God, of surrender to God. Here's the prayer. Jesus, I surrender. I surrender. I know I've done wrong and I believe you died for me. And I invite Jesus into my life right now. I believe you died on the cross and that you came back to life. And from this day forward, I give you my life. You're my king. I give up my old way. I follow you in Jesus' name. If, if you prayed that prayer today, can you raise your hand up high so I can see you? I see hands all over the room, actually, all over the room. Many hands, many hands, 15 hands, maybe. If you are seriously about giving your life to Jesus, your next step is to receive baptism. We're gonna do a baptism in just a few minutes. You'll be able to see it. After this service, you can sign up for our next baptism out in the lobby. I want you that raised your hands to talk to our connection team outside in the lobby and I want you to watch this baptism. I want you to see what happens when somebody goes public with their faith. I want you to see that. Right now, if I could have everyone in our church that is a follower of Jesus to grab one of the communion elements, I wanna end our time in communion. So if you could make your way to the table to get a communion element, I want you to do that. And we're gonna end our time remembering Jesus and inviting his strength into our life. I believe communion um, is more than just remembering Jesus. I do believe there is some grace that is poured into us, some strength. I, I don't claim to have all the answers about some of these mysteries, but there's something powerful about remembering Jesus together and there's something that's, that's poured into us. That's why I think Jesus wanted us to do it as often as we met. Would you, uh, would you hold the bread? And I was just moved by how many in this room raised their hands to receive Jesus. I wanna to speak to each of you this bread that we're holding represents the body of Jesus. It was broken. The night before Jesus was betrayed, 
the next day he would be on the cross. He took some bread. They were having a final meal. It was a Passover meal. And it was a a time to remember when God had taken Israel out of Egypt. And Jesus says, I'm going to be that Passover lamb. My body will be broken for each of you. Guys, as you hold this bread, I want you to know God doesn't have favorites. He doesn't just die for the pastor. He dies for every person. And I think the enemy works overtime to make it make you think it doesn't apply to you, that there's just special people God cares about. Man, that's not true. So hold this bread and know it's for you. So let's pray and thank God for this. Oh, Jesus, you loved sinners. You invited everyone from any walk of life into your company. You didn't exclude anybody. didn't matter where they were from. And for all of us, you died. And we remember the broken body of Jesus as a family. And we are so thankful in Jesus' name. Let's take the bread. And then we hold the cup. And this reminds us that in order to save us, it was his blood, all of it shed for us. He poured his life out. And so let's pray and take this. We remember, Jesus, you poured your life out. Father, we remember that you sent your son and you watched his life poured out on the cross. And you accepted that sacrifice fully as our substitute. And Lord, we no longer are condemned because Jesus has made us right. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to have a celebration outside. Hallelujah, church. We're going to watch some baptism. Pastor Jay. Awesome. If you want to take a moment and pray with someone before you head out to baptism, we'll have our prayer team up at the front. Uh, Don't leave. Uh, Share your burden with somebody that can bring it before Jesus with you. If you have children and you want to see baptism, please pick them up first. And then that way they can be part of it. And also our awesome volunteers can be part of LM Kids. And then if you want a place to serve, Serve the City is coming up October 26th. Three different places you can serve around the city. And all All of those details are in the lobby. We hope to see you outside and have a great week, church.